Um, as the birth is progressing, there is one point where the cesarean discussion happens and then the mother is being wheeled into the operating theater and she's on the bed looking at that theater and that get, a lot of men get stuck there because that is the point where I wish I could have asked, you know, to ask them to stop, asked if there was any other alternatives. This is the Birth Agni Podcast. The fire that brings us alive, that burns myths and opens a channel of authentic natural birth stories. This show debunks the many myths of the medicalized births, showcases the plethora of choices a pregnant couple can make to embark on their empowered birth journey. I'm Divya Kapoor, a certified birth and lactation counsellor and an aspiring traditional birth attendant. Let's get the flames blazing high. Hope you're all doing wonderfully well. Today we are discussing maternal mental health in a very broad spectrum, covering various aspects that contribute to it, birth being a major triggering factor. The guest today is a renowned nervous system therapist, somatic healer who works essentially with brown and Asian families healing culturally rooted emotional issues. Her name is Sangeeta Partisarthi. Let's begin our conversation. So, Sangeeta, you are a somatic mental health therapist. You essentially work with brown and Asian families. You have worked as a doula. And in fact, when we were, uh, you know, coming together for our previous season, uh, you were working as a doula then. And uh, yeah, so when is it that you came to India? We'll start there. And how did the doula work shape you? Oh, yeah. Um, We moved to India about three years ago. And um, I was a practicing doula in the UK and uh, I honestly, you know, this could be me just romanticizing it, but I, I honestly believe that birth workers are a, a unique breed. I think we come into birth work for a reason. Um, a lot of times we come into birth work uh, for what it turns out to be healing our own um, stuff. You know, whether it's our birth, the story of when we were born or the story of when we gave birth. And I say this, right, there are two kinds of birth workers, one ones who have had amazing births. And like, I want to tell the whole world about it. If I could do it, you could do it. Such traumatic uh, birth experiences or pre-birth, post-birth experiences that, you know, we jump in to try and save other women. (laughs) Neither of which is necessarily... uh, coming from an embodied place, but a a lot of us start there, you know, and I think um, I had two home births myself, uh, one which uh, where we transferred into the hospital and then my second one was born at home. This was when we were in the UK. And um, as you know, um, how, you know, an unmedicated, not even unmedicated, a birth where you felt, you know, again, I'm not romantic, filmy, I'm not saying it was a filmy moment where that minute my life, it did, it was very surreal and all that experience of nobody touched me until the baby was born and I was the first one to hold her, I brought her out, out uh, from the water and, you know, then it was like my body had done this, so what can it not do and, you know, I had never been a size zero, I'd never been you know, tons of body shame, the usual, right? I could never uh, thought of myself as pretty or not even that my body was capable or fit or anything, you know? And then once my second one was born, I was like, I can't do this. And then that's when, you know, I went back to work and it just did not make sense to me. So uh, that's when I decided. And and we had hired a doula both times and uh, it was just the most amazing experience for me because... I had been in such a deep, profound manner that I felt held during both my births. And uh, that really went very deep into me, you know, about why we women don't have those experiences of being very deeply held and supported by other women and how much the feminine has been wounded as a collective, you know. Um, so I had been a, an angry feminist all my life growing up in India. Uh, it, that wasn't really a surprise. But seeing that through that lens, I, I could finally feel like that anger had somewhere to go. You know, it could be channelized into a change-making endeavor, you know. Um, and that's what I did. So, you know, and then I 
became a doula and as i would work with clients especially second time mothers i would routinely come up against the trauma of the previous birth or the trauma of the other kinds of trauma where i felt that uh it was inadequate and that i needed more tools to be able to effectively do my work and that is when i got very interested in birth trauma so i became a birth trauma resolution practitioner and so i got to understand trauma um through the lens of birth and uh, so then i moved to india and uh, of course it was a very different landscape and <laughs> um all of that and um it was really eye opening for me and i started appreciating how deeply cultural birth is and the bodies are and what the bodies are storing with respect to birth and the stories we get told and the stories we internalize and that would play out in the birth room over and over again you know and having said that i would also see amazing moments of birth as it does right and it never stops being amazing and it's and then um as this was going on in india um parallelly i became a somatic experiencing practitioner and so very organically i started supporting couples in the perinatal period so you know fertility vaginismus uh, postpartum depression birth trauma um and then you know now i have a practice where i see global clients both men and women for um south asian um uh, trauma patterns the you know outside of birth as well and so now i don't do doula work anymore so i am a full time mental health practitioner and my scope has expanded beyond maternity you you worked with a lot of women who came uh, to you uh, as second time mothers who had stored a lot of trauma into their bodies there was a lot of fear and um, then this fear also gets translated into i mean the entire system of fear with birth and the entire system of how we as individuals work on fear also gets translated into new motherhood and parenting so if i just jump from there into parenting because of this you know sometimes especially like my journey into motherhood after extreme postpartum anxiety was that i realized that there was a lot of internal insecurities there were a lot of as we say raised children i was being raised as a human being by my daughter where yes. she where she kind of brought forward these insecurities and became a mirror like i said in the start to my own problems and the, the more i kept solving them the easier it, it should we prepare new parents especially mothers because maternal mental health is what we are talking about when they are entering into their new the new lives and especially indian households where emotional health is usually um not really uh, you know discussed or uh, catered you know given enough importance to yes yeah and it is sad that uh, india is uh, uh, we don't have a robust system of screening or uh, we're doing shockingly less um in in the maternal mental health aspect for parents uh, through the perinatal period itself so for example there are key tools that uh, care providers should use um to screen these mothers even in the antenatal period so you know even before you give birth there are certain um mental health uh, tools and support systems that we can use scales things like that which can predict uh the risk for postpartum mental health uh, i mean there is so much that maternal mental health provider landscape is very disjointed and uh, you know practitioners are overwhelmed and you know the system of education is highly um niched down which is good in a way but uh, but what it means is that our obgyn uh, and this is not just an indian thing i think it's just a global the way things work is um uh, apart from a referral to a psychiatrist or a psychologist we're not actually trained to listen to mothers um postpartum anxiety depression psychosis ptsd as a result of a traumatic birth 
PTSD as a result of family trauma. You know, the family is unsupportive. The family is shaming. There is gender shaming that you, if you give birth to a girl child, that's shaming about breast milk and all of those stuff. So even mothers who had semi-decent births find themselves facing postpartum trauma uh, with the same intensity as a war veteran. Somebody who returns from a war, when you say PTSD, postpartum stress uh, disorder, you're thinking a white male that's coming back from Iran or Afghanistan who hears the sound of the shrapnel long after the war was over, right? But you're in postpartum bodies, um, that's the same thing that's going on as a result of trauma in the perinatal period. So we don't even have a lot of awareness around it. This I have these screening tools on my website and it's free. So if anybody's interested in these assessments, please go take it. I have a separate birth trauma questionnaire and a separate postpartum depression questionnaire. Sometimes they're comorbid, so you can have both or you can have one or the other and we just don't know how these two are different. And that it needs a very specific skill set to address these things, you know, differently. And that popping a pill is not the only solution or the solution at all. Um, it is a very complex uh, scenario when it comes to maternal mental health globally, but also maternal mental health in India. But to, I'm going to address what you said about the fear angle. And I want to address, uh, yes, there is a lot of fear around childbirth and it's not just, and, and it's easy for us to blame our mothers. But I think that's not okay because uh, there is a very high degree of institutional fear about childbirth. That is, we have practitioners practicing defensive medicine. We are routinely overusing medical interventions. The whole system is fear-driven rather than safety driven, rather than intuition driven. Um, and we're also seeing birth outcomes as an either or, which means that it's either life, life mother, life baby, or the experience of feeling respected, the experience of childbirth itself. And when it comes to birth, it's not an either or, because the safety is in the experience. So unless the mother feels safe, sure. her body is not going to uh, produce oxytocin. And guess what? you will have to medically intervene, which increases birth risk for mother and baby, right? So we should not be talking about this dichotomy, which is so sad and it's such an institution-based fear mongering thing that, you know, we've all, uh, is so prevalent, right? That we have to dispel first, which is that when it comes to birth, the safety is inherent in the experience. So it's not an either or, you know? So, to go address your question around fear, there is institutional fear, there is societal fear because of patriarchy and women being women's bodies being commoditized. And so why why this is going on, I think we are the most disembodied generation of women, I don't know, probably in the history, right? Because we're kind of told to shut off from the womb. We're, 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 we're kind of told to minimize our 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 feminine nature Absolutely. because capitalism is saying run the rat race and run it in a man. so we're doing that until we get we meet the partner and then we're in a relationship we get married etc and then boom as soon as that happens then you're expected you know so how am i going to get in touch with my own feminine self when i've grown up in a purity culture that has consistently shamed my womb my menstruation and um, has told me that the female body itself is sin, you know? Yeah. So it's the seat of sin, right? And how am I supposed to then build a healthy relationship with my womb? How am I supposed to then trust that my body will produce oxytocin? How am I supposed to trust that my very essential feminine motherly self knows exactly how to raise the baby and produce breast milk and be nurturing towards the child when all of that has been so wounded, right? And so filled with fear. Yeah, such a vicious, vicious cycle. And uh, it's all of this when you were saying, I felt you were knocking so many doors for me. And my own postpartum experience, the example you gave of uh, a war, uh, you know, a soldier coming back. When I was 
into postpartum anxiety that I later realized probably was depression. Now that I read of it, um, I was repeating that in the entire labor period again and again and again and trying to find answers. Where was it that I, I went wrong? And yeah. I went back to my doctor and asked, did I not breathe well? Yeah. Was that the reason? And it's still triggering sometimes to me, and which is why uh, we, we, we are having this conversation. And um, again, fear in the system, um, not being allowed to get in touch with your body, and that has physical consequences. Absolutely. My, uh, that my scar was not healing because I was not mentally fit or not um, in the best of my mental state. And as I was helped by my sister again and again and again, I was able to recover. So when we talk about somatics, about your work, about the physical, the, the trauma being uh, stored in the body, how do we go back to all those fears of society, of families, of the culture, of patriarchy, of the system, in fact, in the birth system where we feel we're going to be safe? How do we get those wires healed off one by one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm really sorry to hear about your traumatic birth experience. And um, this is the thing that I keep telling women, right? This is we carry our birth experiences in our bodies for a lifetime. You know, there was once I worked with a 68-year-old 68 lady who came into session with me and you could see her, how much she had stored in her body and what she was carrying about the trauma of her birth, you know, like, I don't know, 40 odd years ago, right? Or however many years ago that was. So um, this is what I mean when I say, and, and, uh, Recurrent flashbacks um, can also be a sign of PTSD, birth trauma, you know, trauma, where the body is reliving um, the traumatic event as if it's happening now. And the psychosomatic symptoms that go with it, the increased heart rate, the, the breathing, you know, all of those things and ruminating thoughts where you can't get past that, the, 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 the event, like play, replaying it over and over again, um, in the mind, you know, so all of that, uh, you know, to me would present as, you know, PTSD, bringing in women into the system, you know, of perinatal care, no matter where it starts, you know, sometimes it starts with um, vaginismus for issues with sex, for example, sometimes it starts with fertility related, um, uh, you know, encounters with the medical, you know, field. But um, so what I would say is, um, that good quality uh, preparation to becoming parents should start with the choice of the right partner. You know, yeah. e and even that choice, because that is a very intentional choice that both partners have to make. Because it is not just about if you want to break cycles, that also starts with having being very intentional about who you choose as partners. And I would even say that it should begin before that, even before you, when you're dating or when you're single, invest in good quality psychoeducation, good quality therapy to get to know yourself, know your triggers and all of, know who you are, you know. We, we kind of put that process out and this is the sad bit, but... In my work, I see this over and over and over and over again, where it all, everything that you didn't really want to see, you can kind of mask it, you can deny it, you can run away from it, you can minimize it until you have that first child, right? Exactly. So until you have that first child and sometimes until you have that second child, but guess what? After that, there is absolutely nowhere to go. Once you have that child, it will put your relationship with your partner in the microscope. You know, things yeah. that you, you between you that are not working, guess what? This is going to put pressure on you. It's like holding it in a microscope. So unless you have that strong foundation of partnership, you can't build on top. And, and, and once you have that child running yeah. the rat race, meeting our deadlines, you know, 
get married before 30, have one before, whatever the timelines are, right? Let's buy a house, let's do that, let's do this. Guess what? Through what I call this deep abyss valley of patriarchy, and there is nowhere to hide. And this, no matter how educated the woman is, no matter how successful in the career she is, she could be out earning the guy by 10x for all I care. Doesn't matter. All of the South Asian marriages go through this ab this valley of patriarchy right after the first one comes, sometimes after the second one comes. And that is the moment of reckoning for the couple, right? And then couples the can actually dig deep. Then they find their voice. Then they find their bounce. The, the marriages that survive is where the couples then really do the work, you know, to get past that and find out who you are as a couple, where you end and the rest of the family begins, what is your values versus what is somebody else's values, being very intentional about how you raise your kids. But a lot of them don't make it, right? And then, and then you know, some of them stop being in partnerships but a lot of them then just become used to parallel parenting right not even co-parenting you know just parallel partners you know coming and going like ships if not already at least in the pregnancy phase get to know each other talk talk about um what kind of what kind of a parent you imagine your partner to be because that is what comes in the way of uh, i i remember a friend and i uh, were having a conversation about a lot of the value system, like you said, interfering with the way they're taking care of the child. And it's become a problem between the couple, which wasn't something yeah. that came up before and the child was. I think ori we orient what to look for in a partner. It begins there, right? Yeah. What we And we have no clue, right? Because, you know, we learn that from movies. We do that. We do this. Even in dating partner, no matter how long, we don't know how to have those conversations because... We don't know how to orient to secure attachment. It's very vulnerable to have these conversations. You know, the foundation of that secure attachment and pro-social behaviors and what attachment actually is, right? And, and we all bring our own attachment wounds into the partnership, right? But that is the time that you work on it before you decide to bring a life into the world, right? And but, and that's the ideal scenario. Many of us, majority of us don't do it. And it's like once the child is there and shit has hit the fan, right? Yeah. Then it's like, oops, oh, okay. So, you know, let's start from the basics. Let's, you know, rewire this thing. And then, you know, they come out on the other side stronger. A lot of marriages do come out on the other end stronger. They go through the abyss and then they come out, you know, stronger. But the thing is, it hits you and it hits you so suddenly that it's like, these are the things that nobody talks about. You know, we talk about labor, we talk about breathing, we talk about breastfeeding. Nobody talks about the fact that when you become a mother, it is going to trigger off. And that is what takes an emotional toll on you about being needed so much, you know. Yeah, all the time, yeah, exactly. Feeling of unloved, you know, not being loved. Because the baby is not probably responsive the way we want as adults the babies to be, children to be, kids to be. And then the relationship is already going through a roller coaster ride. So the feeling of not being loved and birth and parenting, all of it put together into that one basket. And feeling unsupported. I think a lot of right. uh, women kind of been like, they feel unsupported on both sides. You know, there is this feeling that um, your mother, you told me, you pushed me into, you know, you told me that motherhood is ultimate and marriage, blah, blah, you know, the in-laws, their own projections and being like a body who's carrying this thing. And then the partner who doesn't, who, you know, even with the best of intentions, that communication of really seeing it and, and, and holding space, that sort of thing, right? So she feels really done in, right? And then in the career, there is a pause and she feels very resentful because you know look what i gave up and you know now it's like nobody's there and you know this utter feeling of being alone and unsupported right with, with everything you know yeah so i think finding support groups is absolutely crucial i can't stress that enough the you know postpartum um you know mental health going through any kind of mental health um issues is very ice trauma isolates us then you think you're the only one and that you're broken you know so which is why um we, we cannot heal in isolation. And this is why, 
you have to have the support, the peer support of the community. Uh, I run something called the Brown Gram Club, which is a monthly membership. It's a, it's a community where we can all feel seen, heard, belong. It's a safe space. We do so much to keep the safe space. But what I'm saying is, yes, one-to-one -one therapy is great. I do offer one-to-one -one therapy, but that's not the whole picture, you know, because the, the, the original wounding is because we were not held in the community, birth, you know, the whole village that it takes. We either don't have the village or the village is toxic and wounded for many reasons, right? So we almost have to build our own village, right? And that's what we're doing with birth groups, birth support groups. So there are lots of birth networks in India. So if you're in most urban cities in India, there is a birth network associated with it. So find your local birth network for support and hold on to them for dear life. I'm so glad with time, all of this is changing. So when I had Divi, uh, the family dynamics changed and uh, I realized it with time. Almost a year into motherhood, I realized things around me, people around me have started finding their stakes in the baby. And that's very that's normal right. in Indian households, you know. Um, something that about me that was not liked by somebody, I saw it being transferred onto the... So all that change in the family dynamics, it came as a shock, of course. And then it added, it can add to somebody's postpartum blues, anxiety. You, you know, yes. it can deteriorate the postpartum period. Thankfully, mine wasn't just, you know, subtle changes that I was able to acknowledge and go through. For somebody, it can be really daunting. Yes. And, and, and this is why, right? So we are talking about a certain level of what happens postpartum, but... Uh, women who have had early developmental trauma, who grew up in violent households with diagnosed or undiagnosed mental illness, uh, physical violence, abuse, you know, early child. So what would qualify as complex PTSD, which is what I work with, and, you know, it is far more prevalent than we think, again, because, you know, it's, it's really surprising that when we grow up in patriarchy, we're constantly on high alert. Therefore, our bodies spend a lot of time in the fight, flight or freeze response as opposed to being in, um, you know, a thriving mode, you know, a normal, you know, thriving mode. So there is, so when, when we have people with nervous systems that have spent a lot of time in the fight, flight, freeze response, either as very young children or as adults, right? Now that is going to have a significant uh, impact on how your birth is and your postpartum experiences, right? So we are talking about, we can't talk about PPD or PTSD or birth trauma in isolation, right? Because it's like a whole stack of, it's how your nervous system is wired, right? And then when you have birth, a lot of people have very traumatic birth experiences that leaves them feeling helpless and powerless that gets added on to the body right so therefore all of these things are important but that's the thing you know a we can we can we can when you come into the process you have people who can help help you with all of this you know so what are the questions that somebody asks themselves when they're expecting and going into yeah i uh, there is a very comprehensive 75 question uh, cptsd yeah. assessment on my website so sangpath.com you can go take that because we've taken the guesswork out of all of this, right? Like, so I, yes, you know, we, I can tell you some questions, but that's like really comprehensive. And, you know, I, I would say if you're expectant or want to get pregnant, take that test. And if you have moderate or severe, um, you know, the signs of uh, complex PTSD-like symptoms, then start seeing a professional early even before trying to have a kid, right? And it is very, and again, community support, finding, <clears throat> being very intentional about birth choices is a very, very important part of, you know, if you come into the process with moderate to severe, uh, you know, um, trauma symptoms, right, in the body, it is all the more important that you have a birth experience where, you don't feel helpless or powerless. It's all the more important that you feel you find a care provider 
who will respect your choices who will not touch you without consent who will slow down the process for you who will feel you you know like you are in control it's a very very important thing so you 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 work with somatics and somatics kind of um, talks about your how your brain works and how your body responds to that uh, those emotions so how does somatics heal you if if i okay so what happens in the body when we okay so when you're going through normal life um you you generally feel like um, it is safe connection feels safe the world feels safe etc and then when you have triggering overwhelming incidents your body goes into the fight or flight state it, because it's an evolutionary safeguard to keep you safe right and then in the in what usually happens in the jungle with wild animals is that after the threat goes away all of this energy mobilized in the body this nervous energy needs somewhere to go so they would tremble they would shiver etc or they would run it off etc but because we humans are socially conditioned not to do that sometimes those nervous energy patterns can get stuck in the body the incomplete defense responses the thing that you should have said to the doctor back then a, a very common trauma place where people uh, keep reliving it is um as the birth is progressing there is one point where the cesarean discussion happens and then the mother is being wheeled into the operating theater and she's on the bed looking at that theater and that get, a lot of men get stuck there because that is the point where i wish i could have asked you know to ask them to stop asked if there was any other alternatives um you know why is this whatever needed to happen back then that didn't get completed right and uh, that element of choice being taken away so how what we work in somatics is to recreate no conditions first create conditions of safety where we slow things down and then we help our bodies mobilize and complete the defense responses that we couldn't back then which gets trapped in the body as trauma right that is why we have those recurrent um flashbacks of certain things in the postpartum period a lot of uh, times uh, with abusive family members and all of that you know women talk to themselves loudly after the fact you know if you're in the office working but your thoughts are oh she said this and this is what i should have said and sometimes your children come to you and say mama you're talking to yourself who are you talking to or what did you just say and we are not even here in that room yeah, yeah very common yeah yeah so all of those are unmobilized trauma responses right so when in session we help complete those things that weren't completed in an atmosphere of safety therefore there is bottom up re- rewiring of the nervous system towards safety right so that's how the work works just to ask a personal question like i get triggered triggered in the sense i start crying and i i'm not as strongly triggered now as i used to with my own uh, birth story and uh, all of that so is crying also something that should be ha- put a handle to or you shouldn't cry or is it okay how does one assess one situation crying crying can be a release crying can be you know a, a powerful you know sort of release mechanism and you know i would always look at it um in the larger picture you know what function is it having and what um how is it received and all those things like it's it's a more complicated answer but yeah i mean in general we're not just saying that any feelings need to be stopped right so yeah makes sense as a general um as a general principle most emotions are welcome but again you know in session work also containing it right so we're having a we are giving it a safe place to go so that is what brings in the regulation because if it's in a place where there is not that holding safe container and co regulation then it has nowhere to go because it doesn't get metabolized or integrated as a story and then we get stuck in circles true and 
with all of this work of somatics and when we talk about birth work and all of that you know the environment being good and you being hurt to believe in all of that because we have so many stories of uh, stories that are not in support and stories that you know are still in the system stuck in the system when somebody comes to you for somatics and even when you were a doula do you think there is some amount of trust in the mind and the body and the soul that is required to uh, go through these sessions successfully hmm yeah that's a very good question um one of the basic organizing principles of somatic work any kind of somatic work is that there is a very basic core biological imperative you know some people call it organic intelligence some people call it you know what's what's a coherent coherence okay but something that underpins all somatic work is that there is a certain inherent orientation in the body towards um more coherence healing organization integration um ease pleasure secure attachment connection safety all of these okay so what i'm saying there is that it's not that tr- what trauma does is it sort of takes our focus to what's not working which it's not you know the so you know when when there is things stuck uh, so so the work restores or helps what is already working in the body to self organize so what i'm saying is for anybody to come into this work to reach to support to read up so so many of you are going to listen to this podcast but uh i'm guessing there's only a few who might reach out wanting to know more right so when you reach out wanting to know more or you book that first session this is already evidence that something is working something in the body has already organized towards reaching out for healing right and that the reserves are there in the body it's not like we are giving it that or somebody comes with that it's not like that right because <clears throat> it's already there that's that's how the body functions on its own we're just helping restore it that's all yeah so uh, kind of saying that um, you have a thread which is already entangled but you that's know right. deep down it's connected there so you just pull that's right you pull pull that one string and then open it so it gets goes back to that connection that's yeah. right and then the rest of it organizes that's right. right so when you hold it you're facilitating it um and you're doing a certain set of things and then it self organizes right it's like a spring you know the spring that is stuck and then you know it goes back in place yeah. right yeah. yeah and with all of this i wanted to say uh that sometimes we don't reach out reach out because we have again that uh, conditioning of the society of being judged maybe you know what would come out of that diagnosis and you know again going back to our safe space that we believe is our safe space uh, so to just just saying and because i have been through this it's very important to reach out and we are not less of because when you reach out you realize realize that there is so much resonance you know there are people who have gone through it their stories and then that community gets formed and you kind of take that community that new village with you so there's nothing wrong in reaching out it's really really important to reach out to talk to listen to stories to listen to people who give you that confidence uh, and maternal mental health is really important because at the end uh, the, the crux of all this is the woman who's handling uh, in the system the baby and the new role of motherhood I'm trying to balance it all like we show on the mothers day post which which shouldn't be you absolutely yeah. yeah no but when we heal births we're healing it for all of humanity that comes after so birth is the most potent window for us to heal all of this 
you know, the stuff that's not working that we've somehow carried in our bodies, right? So birth is that portal. When we heal birth, I strongly believe that we can heal so much of what's not working in humanity right now. But all mental health has so much to do with our own backgrounds, with our own culture, with our own society, and with our own predisposition to all these things based on our own experiences. I hope you found this podcast helpful. Gonna see you soon next week. You know, and I I hope that if you're a birth worker worker listening to this, that you can also commit to doing the inner work because guess what? Birth work will trigger your deepest wounds, the things that you don't want to look at, right? There is a field beyond fear where the body is empowered to take on labor and birth. To land there, it is crucial to take birth education. To enroll into our unique labor and birth preparation course, reach out to us at www.birthagni.com or scroll through all available prenatal and postnatal preparation classes. Thank you for listening. All in the spirit of birth, womanhood and freedom. Remember, you got the bar. This podcast is about physiological birth and does not offer or claim to provide medical knowledge or diagnosis.